Um, Liz, uh, Professor Lewis, Liz Grant is going to lead off. She's our co-chair for the session today. Uh, Professor Grant is professor at uh, University of Edinburgh, Scotland, um, and um, will be uh, speaking first and introducing uh, Professor Felicia Knoll, and then we'll go to the second uh, part of this webinar, which will be about uh, impact in low and middle income countries. Uh, we'll have three speakers, and we hope to have around a half an hour at the end to have questions um, and answers. So welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Professor Grant, can you please, uh, over to you, take it away. Thank you, Stephen, and welcome everyone. Um, in these next 20 minutes or so, um, uh, Professor Narl and myself are going to talk about how palliative care is impacted by the way that the pandemic is shaping and influencing our health systems. Because COVID-19 pandemic has tested the very resilience of health systems across the globe. And health systems have been found wanting. The pandemic has shocked systems and, and systems in shock do two things. They retract and they retreat. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about what health systems do and how this pandemic is shaping them. And then we'll look at the role of palliative care, how palliative care has been changed by the reshaping of health systems, but how palliative care is also changing the system. And really critically, the ways in which palliative care can offer new insights and thinking into the way that we move forward in our health systems. So health systems, we, we, use, we use the term, and health systems are not just one thing. They're a complex web of people, of services, of systems, of actions, of organizations, uh, informal and formal, which together promote and restore and protect and sustain health. And health systems do, or they're meant to do three things. Health systems set out to improve health indicators and in advancing health outcomes, reducing health inequalities, they set out to be responsive to the whole of population needs. And that's about ensuring access to quality care, respecting dignity, ensuring confidentiality, ensuring that patient autonomy, ensuring quick care. And thirdly, they set out to be fair, to think about a fair distribution of health care for all in the population within the principles now of universal health coverage so that no one suffers financially, financial hardship in seeking and using health care. So what are health systems like? What's happening? What do they need to do in a pandemic? Well, in a pandemic, health systems need to be able to detect the daily warning signals of this pandemic creep. They need to be able to isolate the threats to system continuity, they need to be able to isolate disease, they need to be able to maintain the core functions to tackle disease. They need to be able to work collectively with all the assets across the health system for the common goal of keeping the system strong and tackling the pandemic. And fundamentally, they need to be able to continue to deliver the essential health services to maintain and sustain the health of nations. So what's happening? In pandemics, I'm going to talk about four changes in health systems that really are impacting on palliative care. So in pandemics, the priorities of health system change. Resources are reallocated and they're reallocated quite rapidly. So there's a risk that palliative care, which is already poorly funded in a number of health systems, actually gets even less resource. Staff are relocated. And we know that staff have been pulled out of what's seen as non-essential services and pulled into COVID responses. Hospital spaces and clinic spaces can be relocated as well and redesigned for taking up and supporting COVID work. And often these spaces, as happened in Italy, are spaces that were the palliative care wards. In, in pandemics, something else happens. The political focus of a health system changes because political leadership starts to shine a lens on the health system because the health system is its one sort of strategy 
to implement the strategies that the, the national, system, national government, the political system has put in place. And the thing is, these strategies for tackling the pandemic have been designed often outside the health system, not in it. And yet the health system is being conditioned and, and asked to respond and report and make this work. But that has another implication as well, because governments, political leaders, national leaders can begin to look at the gain and success of a health system, but they can also begin to look at the blame um, and failure. And there's a catch here, because in many health systems, the failure of tackling the pandemic is counted in the number of deaths. And this is very important as we think about the role of palliative care and the role of normalising and accepting and supporting and working with what is a natural event, death, but what's not natural is early and preventable death. So we've got, we're working within this strange situation. Pandemics also do something else. They change the way that pathways of care are delivered. The delivery of services is already conditioned by the strategies that uh, governments are using. It's conditioned by lockdown. It's conditioned by the quarantine systems. It's conditioned by shielding those who are most vulnerable. But that also means that those who need care may not be receiving the care. It's also conditioned by the fact that the whole of end of life care has changed rapidly. It's changed in the course of these last three months in a way that we never anticipated because staff who had not been used to dealing with people who have, who have end of life care needs, staff are now faced with dealing with those staff who had not, have not had any training. So there's a huge pressure again and a huge opportunity for the palliative care community to be responsive to, to, to staff. And finally, pandemics, in pandemics, people's needs change, as does the way people use the health system. Because pandemics not only are about a physical disease, pandemics exacerbate the psychological the emotional, the social, the spiritual distress that people are feeling as the fear of this disease, the silence of it, the invisibility that it runs through the community begins to take its toll and particularly mental health, health issues are increasing rapidly in this pandemic because there's a huge stigma attached and health systems are being called to respond to this. The current pandemic has illustrated a couple of things. I say that almost no health system is properly pandemic prepared. And in systems which are poorly resourced, and actually I think even more significantly, in systems which are inequitably resourced or inequitably structured, the pandemic is taking its, its, its toll. It's taking its toll where there's no infection control or very poor infection control, where there's a lack of personal protective equipment, a lack of coordination of services, logistical bottlenecks, where there's reduced auxiliary staff, where actual health worker staff are off sick. There are greater numbers dying and becoming rapidly ill than we had anticipated. Clinicians are struggling. There's rationing of health care. There's immediate ethical decisions that no one anticipated having to make. There's fragmentation of services. So in the light of all of this, we, are look, we want to now look at where, what is the place of palliative care and how palliative care responds to this. Palliative care is critical to alleviating serious health-related suffering associated with COVID-19. It's an essential component of universal health coverage. And it's in, in this pandemic, there is a danger that it's overlooked. So what I'm going to do now is ask Professor Felicia Noyle, who's a professor at Miami University and the chair of that landmark commission on palliative care and pain relief to speak about the essential nature of palliative care. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you so much, Liz, and I want to thank uh, all of the organizations that lead at the global, regional, and national level efforts around access to palliative care and pain relief. And of course, and in particular, those four that are organizing this, this wonderful symposium today. And thank you, Liz and Stephen, for co-moderating 
this and in the background for Liliana de Lima, who is not visible for you on the screen, but very visible to us in the background, uh, who has organized all of this. Um, what I'll share with you are some slides today that were developed as part, largely as part of our Lancet Commission on global access to palliative care and pain relief, and in this case, um, working very closely with Dr. Afsa Badilia, who I know is also here with us, let's say in the background, listening in. Um, we have a very unusual set of circumstances from which to try to analyze health systems. I've been asked to share with you um, some of the, the basics of the report the way we've thought about palliative care until now and palliative care need and some of the increasing challenges and pressures and the way that we can think about health systems. I'll close with a few thoughts at the end about what is uh, what are huge opportunities that we have and some of the major pitfalls that we're facing and the ways in which we have to think about analyzing the situation that is going to come uh, like a tsunami in particularly the, the developing world. And let me just say before we, we start with the slides that for all of you who I know, and there are many who have already suffered COVID themselves or have a COVID-19 loss or are facing caregiving, that our heart goes out to you for this. We know that it is a tremendous, tremendously painful situation, um, not only for patient, but for caregiver and family and, uh, and, and very stressful and thank you to those caregivers who are with us, who we know are battling on the front lines uh, every day, including those in our own U Health system at the University of Miami at the front lines as we move towards the peak in our own battle with COVID in South Florida. Um, Stephen, could we have the first slide, please? Um, are you able to see it on the screen? Um, actually, all I'm able to see now is, the, um, is our five wonderful faces and four logos. Gosh, okay. Well, we're going to have to reboot. We're having some technical problems with PowerPoint at the moment. Uh, let me keep talking and I'll get this sorted for us. Okay. Perfect. So, um, why don't we think about the conclusions then, um, in a sense, to begin with? And the conclusions that I wanted to share with you are that we have a number of items at our disposal that we never had in the past that produce opportunities for us uh, to move forward. Um, the first is that we have responsible leadership in a number of countries. Canada is one, and as many of you may have seen, there's a Forbes article about what do several countries, six or seven of them have in common, and that is female leadership. And so we have some wonderful leaders in our world who have known to have evidence-based policymaking in their approach to this and particularly preparing their health systems, preparing their economic systems, supporting the poor, combating inequality, and also guaranteeing to the best possible way preparedness for this pandemic. Then we have telemedicine and we have a way of connecting, not with all, but with the majority of people in our world through handheld devices um, that make access a whole different um, way of providing medicine than anything that we could have thought about in the past, including the kind of medicine that is simply about um, the basic sorts of support and outreach to many who are elderly and alone. I'll just finish with this part and then go ahead with the slides that I think are, are up now. We have the possibility of using communications to be able to do massive online training, including for palliative care, and we have some global organizations that are truly working and get it around the issues that, that are so needed for pain relief and palliative care, including um, the INCB, who has called on countries to come forward and take advantage of emergency opportunities to rapidly uh, bring in opioid medicines for pain relief and, uh, and for breathlessness. And then finally, and probably most importantly, we have seen a kind of global solidarity. We have seen that even in countries with irresponsible leadership, and maybe I'll go to that in just a minute before we go to the slides now that I've started it. Even, even in those countries, what we've seen is an outpouring of individuals, families, communities, societies, the private sector, pharmaceutical companies coming forward and looking to ways to respond when their own particularly federal governments are not responding. Um, I'm sure we'll go into this in, in, in greater detail in the Q&A. Um, I represent much more a, a view from Latin America 
and also from our own non-governmental organizations, the two that I represent in Mexico, the Mexican Health Foundation, Fundación Mexicana para la Salud, and, uh, and my own NGO that works with women's health issues called Tomate la Pecho. And the sorts of issues that we're facing that I'm sure we'll discuss Discuss again when we get into the, the more regional and country specific pieces um, are in fact irresponsible leadership and we know that this virus is extremely democratic in how it attacks people it's not at all democratic in who dies and who lives but it's pretty democratic in how it attacks people of all different incomes so irresponsible leadership that we're seeing in a set of countries primarily Mexico Brazil Venezuela which have taken down any kind of preparedness that was there in the past, and there was preparedness for pandemics in the past, those put entire regions and the world at risks in new kinds of ways. I want to turn now to more of the, the general issues regarding pain relief and palliative care and suggest we go through the slide deck. And then in the end, I'll, I'll make a few comments, um, particularly regarding the, the gender dimensions of this, of this pandemic in the health system. Um, so Stephen, can we go to the first slide, please? As many of you, I'm hoping online, will have seen, and if not, it is a free download from The Lancet, um, 61 authors from 25 countries around the world prepared and signed our Lancet Commission on Global Access to Palliative Care and Pain Relief report called Alleviating the Access Abyss. It pushes for universal coverage and incites health systems, global, regional, and national, to live up to what they should be doing. This commission was led by the University of Miami in collaboration with Harvard University, and the ongoing work follow-up to this commission sits with the IHPC, which I'm uh, thrilled to be on, on their board and helping Liliana and Lucas and others to be able to move those uh, recommendations that we made forward. It is what we call a diagonal approach. It was a group of health system and global health experts working with a number of palliative care specialists, many of whom I'm sure are on online today, and I look forward to their insights as we did when we wrote this report. Next, please. There are five key messages to our Lancet Commission report, and they hold true still today. Um, we sought to tell the world the global access to palliative care and pain relief to alleviate serious health-related suffering is both a global health and an equity um, imperative. We talked about a universal and affordable essential package of services for palliative care and pain relief to alleviate that suffering. We showed that low and middle income countries can improve the welfare of poor people significantly by publicly financing that package as part of universal health coverage. Very important for this particular webinar, we called for international and balanced collective action that involves both global, regional, and national health systems, and even subnational. And then finally, we called for much better evidence and priority setting tools, in particular to monitor performance. Next slide, please. We talked about a global burden in 2015, those were our data of serious health-related suffering, and that burden in that point of time was huge. More than 61 million people worldwide and more than 6 billion days of suffering and up to 21 billion days of suffering and about four-fifths of that 80% in low and middle income countries. Now what I put on this slide that probably many of you have seen before is that this is now plus COVID-19. So any kind of need, any demand for services that we saw before, largely unmet, now you have to augment, at least in the short term, the COVID-19 demand, which includes families and caregivers. And probably what we're going to see also is a lot of complex grieving that also requires the kind of palliative care services that we calculated before as in great need. Next, please. We traced access to palliative care and pain relief at that point in time around access to distributed opioid morphine equivalent or what we call DOME. And we found that the poorest 50% of our world have access to only 1% of DOME, of distributed opioid morphine equivalent. And that the richest 10% have access to 90%. Next slide, please. When we look at this globally, we see an incredibly an inequitable map of distribution um, and this is a map, again, that many of you have seen before with an engorged Canada in the U.S. and Australia and a Western Europe that seems to be about the same size. 
Now subtract from this need around breathlessness and pain related to COVID-19. And what we're going to see is this map shrink even further. It was the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this map is going to shrink even worse. Next slide, please. And we, we mapped this in two concentric circles of access. One for only palliative care need, as you see on the probably the left-hand side of your screen as you're facing it. And only those highest income countries had reasonable amount of access with even in many countries, some parts of the population without access. That's that sort of dark burgundy um, triangle of the left-hand side smaller circle. And then we projected total need, all different kinds of needs for opioid equivalents. And that's that smaller inner circle projected based on use in Western Europe. Now add COVID-19. And we don't know exactly how much bigger that circle is going to get. And it depends, I believe, in large part in low and middle income countries on what the policy response around social distancing and access may be. But it may get bigger and bigger when we add into that COVID-19 needs. But as, of, as far as we know now, access is not increasing at nearly that rate, despite again calls by the INCV to encourage countries to have additional ac access to import more, to generate more. We're not seeing anywhere near the kinds of response that we fear we're going to have to have to to look for. Next, please. Now I wanted to mention briefly something about prices, because when we looked at how much it would cost to close the gap, we produced two different prices. One at current prices that countries are paying, demonstrating that particularly low and lower middle income countries have to spend much more than high income countries per milligram that they use. And the best international prices, which are much lower, about two thirds lower, if countries were able to access the same prices that high income countries are seeing. Now, the question at the bottom is, at that point, what prevents poor countries from accessing more competitive and lower prices? And until COVID-19, I gave you a set of reasons why, and many of them had to do with information, with aggregating demand. But in the face of COVID-19, what we're seeing for opioid medications, as well as many other kinds of supplies and input, is that high income countries also have a tremendous increase in need and prices are either going to go up or we're going to have to figure out a much better way of facilitating supply than anything that we've seen until now. Next, please. We developed this essential package um, and it's a little bit off on the slide I can see, but that's the same essential package. I mean, in terms of how it's, you're gonna see it, that um, green bar should have been around the morphine, which is um, oral immediately relief and injected, released off patent morphine. And um, we talked about a package that includes obviously not only morphine, but as I just mentioned, a number of other inputs around medical equipment and human resources. Now in today's world with COVID-19 for palliative care, add into that equipment all of the protective um, items, units, protective equipment, the PPE that we know that our providers require and that the vast majority, particularly those caregivers at home, will never have access to. Next, please. So now turn to health systems. We have a definition of universal health coverage that says that all people must obtain the health services they require, and that ranges from prevention through to palliative care. There are a wave of global health reforms attempting to make this happen in the context of very complex epidemiologic transition. And even in that context, palliative care and pain control were ignored in most countries. Now you add in a wave of need from COVID-19, the pandemic, and you generate a chaos in health systems in ability to be able to react effectively. Next, please. When we think in a general way about health systems in the face of epidemiologic transition and complex needs without COVID-19, still pre-COVID-19, we need to think about health systems having to meet the needs of continuum of disease, and that includes primary prevention, early detection, diagnosis, treatment, survival, 
survivorship and palliative care for chronic illness, in addition to the demands of communicable illness, as well as having each health system function work properly. And we've used a four function model of stewardship, which is around good leadership, financing, delivery, and resource generation. Um, some entities use a larger list of functions. WHO tends to have six, some tend to have eight. The four work fine for the kind of analysis that we're going to do um, in, the, in the next set of slides. Next, please. So this is what any health minister would normally face. This very complex diagram of trying to think about aligning along a horizontal base, each function of the health system from leadership or stewardship to resource generation along each of the vertical slices, which is the complex life cycle of chronic illness. You can take any one slice, horizontal or vertical, and what you'll find is if you only think that way, you get inefficient and ineffective um, production of the services that are required. You either only invest in prevention and you still get people who need treatment, you only invest in treatment, and then you have an overflow because you didn't invest in, um, in prevention. And if you don't invest in palliative care and pain relief, you have the kind of excess suffering that we see in our world. So this is the complex picture um, that we have on this map. By the way, I should just say that the, the logo that ends up is Pallium India, and Raj is definitely a co-author of this report, a leading co-author, a leading commissioner of the report, but he may or may not want to take responsibility for these slides. So just to, just to note that you're probably seeing that, that logo at the top of the page, as am I. Um, and if Raj is on, I'm sure he'll have it's comments. A that, no, 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 no problem. I just know not sure that everybody can see that. So I wanted to at least mention that um, I should take responsibility for the slides. Um, so you have this complex picture that health uh, ministers are going to have to deal with, as well as all of those in the health system. And you have to think that before epidemiologic transition, um, there was really only one slice vertically. You either treated a communicable illness and the person died or didn't and then went on to the next. Non-communicable disease and chronic illnesses produce this much more complex picture onto which we're now introducing a highly communicable disease called COVID-19, which has a set of very immediate needs. Next slide, please. Now, what we want every health system to try to do is what you see on the left-hand side sort of in orange, and that is to have di diagonal synergistic vertical and horizontal integration across each function of the health system. And I'm sorry, I'm not sure why the, the orange and the blue came out on this, but we want that integrated block. We don't want health systems to think only vertically, which are those vertical lines, disease by disease, as we saw happen often with HIV AIDS, with parallel health systems being created, and then the difficulty of figuring out how to meet the needs of others. We don't want the kind of horizontal segmentation that I just talked about, where you think only about financing and not about delivery or revenue generation. And we definitely don't want atomized vertical and horizontal segmentation, which is what we often see in health systems that are fractured um, particularly between private and, and public providers. Um, now, COVID-19 is very different because what we're seeing, as Liz pointed out, is we have to see some vertical attention to this disease. We are seeing hospitals um, converted into COVID hospitals, and particularly in low and middle income countries, those are hospitals that before were the only places that the poor could go to have their chronic illness treated. Um, in Mexico, we're seeing places like um, the Hospital de Nutrición Salvador Subirán, the, the best place for complex um, non-communicable disease where the poor could go, um, previously supported by the Seguro Popular, now converted into a COVID-only hospital. And the question is, where will these patients go in the meantime? And there is not, unfortunately, a good answer to that question in, in the world, in the developing world, today. Next slide, please. Now, we talked, and we won't go into this slide, I just wanted to tell you, you can look, at, look it up in the report. What we did under the guidance and leadership of, of Julio Frank, 
who uh, took care of our health systems group in the, in the Lancet Commission work. We analyzed for every health system function, what extra do health systems need to do, national health systems, in order to achieve universal access to palliative care and pain relief in the context of universal health coverage. So he said, there are a number of things that every health system has to do, no matter what. But in addition, you have to do these set of things in order to guarantee that palliative care and pain relief are fully integrated, fully funding, fully financed, sorry, and universally accessible to all in your population. And, and those extras are what we asked health ministers to think about um, and to be able to make possible in order to be able to achieve, at that time, the SDGs through universal health coverage. Next, please. There's quite a long list there, and I highlighted just a few on, on this slide. Under financing, to highlight the idea of explicit inclusion in national insurance and social security. And at that point, we were thinking of how this package had to be financed in a series of very forward-thinking health systems, like at that time, the Mexican health system with the Seguro Popular. Since the time of writing, the Seguro Popular was closed. So I now can't even speak in Mexico about including this in a national health insurance fund that covers 54 million people because that was closed in January, only a few months ahead of when COVID would strike. Okay. So a health system that was actually weakened unknowingly in the face of COVID through a transition that there was not evidence-based, I would say, but that no matter what, left the health system very exposed and vulnerable to a tsunami of need around palliative care and pain relief and all other health services that's coming with COVID-19. We also talked about, for example, human resources in that case. And we asked that every country, every university, which is probably the more important ask, that no university graduate a medical care expert, someone working in health, from physicians, nurses, social workers, and other support staff, including clergy, that none graduate without at least one course, one basic course in palliative care and pain relief, which in today's world, um, is not the standard. In Mexico, at the time of doing this research, only about one in 10 university programs included an obligatory or um, non-mandatory course in palliative care and pain relief. So hit COVID. We don't have that kind of a base that had we had it, the system would have been much more prepared the way that Liz was speaking about. We don't have that now. The question is what to do. And that's where I was mentioning when we started this incredible asset that we have for rapid training online using many of the tools that have been provided by some of our regional um, and global palliative care organizations as a way of filling in. The, the stable equilibrium though, would be to make sure that because every healthcare provider at some point is going to meet a patient and more often than once, in, in, a, in a period of time, I mean, a patient and family that requires palliative care and pain relief, they should be trained for that, the way they get basic training in many other standards of care, like maternal health. Next, please. So I closed with that. I wanted to say a little bit more. We talked about, when I started, I went to sort of the, the conclusions to talk about what we have at our disposal that we sort of didn't have in the past. And we talked about some responsible leadership, including leadership by women. We talked about telemedicine. We talked about training opportunities. We talked about opportunities like those being offered by the INCB. I contrasted that a little bit in the presentation. I'll say it more explicitly, at least in the Latin America region, with what at best we can call irresponsible leadership that is not evidence-based and is sometimes even around power grabbing associated with this pandemic. And I highlighted three countries where we're extremely worried, which is Mexico, Brazil, and Venezuela. I also wanted to highlight why I talked about increasing need and, and suggest that we think about both increasing need by our palliative care patients and their families because of social distancing measures, which I prefer to call physical distancing measures, which is exactly the issue. We physically distance 
loved ones from those in most need. And that's where we have to think about the difference between social relations and that physical relationship and use, for example, technology to the best of our ability. And another whole block of need, which are COVID patients and their families, who again are going to suffer complex bereavement issues and require additional care. And in many countries, what we haven't seen is what is going to happen when those family members are the only caregivers without any kind of PPE of protective equipment and how this disease can flood through those families and communities when they're forced to give that kind of care themselves because the health system cannot. And one final point that I do think we need to consider in great detail is that there are strong gender aspects here. Um, while we have seen that this uh, virus tends to, has tended to kill more men than women, that is only what we've seen, first of all, in high income countries and relatively strong health systems. But second, what we've also seen is how this pandemic has gripped women as caregivers both paid as providers, physicians, nurses, social workers, clergy, and also as unpaid caregivers. In the home, we've had to take on many kinds of roles that for many decades, a number of women had been able to share in different kinds of ways. And also what I think, as I said, we're going to see come is a tsunami of women taking care of poor patients, patients with COVID and becoming heavily infected themselves with a high viral load. And so I think we need to think very carefully about the gender aspects of this and support for caregiving at a community and a family level. I'll just close by saying that I do think there are a number of positive things that can come out of what can only be described as a calamity. And I think what can come out of this is a much better world with more solidarity, but also a world in which we understand better how to work from different places, including our own homes, how to use technology in very different ways to provide training and to provide support, and maybe even a world in which we will finally find echo for the incredible need to provide appropriate global access to pain relief medications in the right way to all of those in need using a balanced approach. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Felicia. <clears throat> Excellent. Uh, physical uh, distancing, but not emotional distancing. Um, we are going to now push ahead. Um, by the way, I'm Dr. Stephen Connor, the Executive Director for WHPCA. Um, and uh, we are expecting uh, to have three presentations. Uh, one um, of our presenters is uh, tied up at present, so he may or may not be able to join us, Dr. Larry Rika. But we'll go right ahead uh, to um, have Dr. Edin Hamza, who is Chief Executive of Hospice Malaysia, give us um, the reality on the ground and the perspective of the um, um, Asia Pacific region. Edin, please, over to you. Oh, you need to unmute, sorry. Okay, um, thanks hey. very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, it was really wonderful to listen to you, Felicia and, and Liz, because um, as you gave your presentation, I could sort of feel the, um, the narrative as we move along with, with, this, with what's happening on the ground. So what I really wanted to do was really try and give a flavor of um, how things have been um, in Malaysia and, and, and the, in the Asia Pacific as well. A bit. Um, it just seemed a very short while ago when things seemed very, very normal and then uh, it's all turned upside down. Um, I just feel that in, in the lower middle income countries, we already have inherent healthcare systems which are already underfunded and under-resourced to start off with. Um, we're only just starting to develop palliative care in, in our uh, countries. Um, and this has really come at a very bad time. Um, we've got social care systems which are not well coordinated to start with and in, in, in how it is supposed to assist patients and other vulnerable communities um, in many of our countries. Um, but we have got agencies, NGOs, and civil society that are trying, to best, trying their best 
in helping these people with what resources they have, sometimes with the help of governments, um, sometimes with very little um, assistance from, from governments. Um, and on, on reflection, the, um, this COVID-19 pandemic has affected the community in a way that others have rarely done in, in, the, in the recent future. Um, it's affected not just the physical health, but also financial, social, psychological, and spiritual um, areas of concern. And I think that it's, it's really the very areas that we in palliative care are so involved with, with in, in the way that we frame our work. Um, in many of our countries um, where palliative care is still rudimentary um, or sometimes with some development, the government acknowledgement of the importance of palliative care has been rather patchy. Um, it's always seen as, as the back burner, as the, in, in behind the, all the curative um, uh, specialties. We have got limitation in terms of our access to essential medicine. Um, as, as you said, Felicia, in terms of training and education, both in medical nursing colleges and allied health, there's not very much um, in terms of palliative care education. Um, there are very few policies within our healthcare systems that support palliative care development um, in order to contribute to, to the healthcare of each country. And, and in saying that, um, in, in many of our countries, everything's gone completely nuts in the last two months or so. Um, in Malaysia, um, in February 15, we only had 22 confirmed cases, um, and now we're on 5,000. Um, and I remember that in, in early February, when we had just a few cases, uh, I was thinking now, is this really going to reach my country? Um, we, we started to look at our supply of medicines and to think how much do we have in terms of morphine and other essential medicines that we have. Um, by that time, we never thought of things like PPE at that point. Now that this has become the, the buzzword that every, everyone wants to get hold of. Um, within a few weeks, the numbers had increased significantly. And within a, within a month, and on March the 18th, we had our own version of lockdown. And only essential services were allowed to operate. And we were concerned, was palliative care an essential service? Uh, we didn't really have any direction. Um, and we needed to find some answers. And eventually we were, we were allowed to, to operate as, as much as possible. Um, with regards to the national response, what we heard mainly was, as, as what you said, Felicia and Liz, that the response was, was in reallocation and, and redesignating re hospitals for COVID-19 care. And most of this were dealing with um, hospital-based systems. Um, I'll probably say that I work in the community. Um, I provide a community service and I have a caseload of about 2,000 patients a year and at any time we've got about 400 cases. And what we felt was that there was hardly any mention of, the, of, of community care um, in, in this response. Um, so we were rather, rather sort of by surprise as to, okay, how do we deal with, with all of this? Um, and and in, in that sense, we needed to think, um, how do we respond to this? There was, certainly was some discussions among, amongst our palliative care community, both in hospitals and in, 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 in the community, um, to see how we could work as, as a community to improve um, the care of the patients that we have and also to deal with this pandemic. Um, Certainly, uh, there, we searched for guidelines and, and there were some um, across the world in, 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 in the Western areas uh, generally and also from, from Asia. From my team, we felt that this was something that was very important and personal to each of us. Um, we had an open discussion and we felt it was important to raise each person's fear, concern, and anxiety onto something that was a mystery. But we felt that amongst um, the fear and anxiety, there was also hope and pride in what they were doing and wanting to be part of, of 
the response to COVID-19. Um, and so we rapidly moved to establish new working guidelines um, dealing with safety at work, um, where would we get necessary um, equipment, medicine to equip the team um, so that they can continue to deliver care under new conditions. So what I probably wanted to sort of deal with now is to address some of the issues that we identified, um, some of which are covered by the various guidelines that we received. And these guidelines were coming in every few days. There were new ways of doing things. Um, and perhaps to highlight some of the things that guidelines don't really cover for um, and which we needed to sort of think through. Um, so the first thing was that, okay, everyone has a, was worried about safety and PPE. Uh, what do we need? Where do we get them from? Um, nobody wanted to sell us anything. Um, and if they were willing to sell us something, the, the prices were going up by several hundred um, percent. But we worked with, with the civil society and communities and donations started to flow through. So that was very, very useful. Um, a few others we had to buy, um, unfortunately. Um, we were concerned about how would we um, see our patients in the middle of, of a lockdown situation. In, in Malaysia, there were roadblocks, roads were being closed. Um, and what we were noticing was that um, it became apparent that many of the police that were manning roadblocks didn't quite know that there were such things as community healthcare workers, community palliative care services. Um, so in the first couple of weeks, the team were continually being questioned, where are you traveling to? What were you doing? Um, and that created anxiety. Um, but gradually now, um, people have got to know our team and, and it's been a bit easier to, to go through roadblocks, um, especially now that we've also been supplied by official letters by the Minister of Health. So that has been very, very useful. Um, the, certainly the guideline was that only see patients um, when necessary. As much as possible, um, do teleconferencing, telephone calls. But one of the difficulties was that not everyone has, has access to um, phone calls, uh, telephones or, or internet um, as well. And the other aspect was that it actually requires very good communication skills. Um, and we were quite concerned that uh, telephone calls and face-to-face -face visit doesn't always tally. Sometimes when we call the patient, they said, there's not really very much problems, everything's okay. But when you go and see the patient, um, you get a completely different picture. And it also depends on who you speak to. Uh, speaking to caregivers, you may get a, a different flavor of a problem. Speaking to a different caregiver, we get a different flavor. So I think that um, we certainly highlighted that it's, it's telecommunication requires um, very good skill sets. And, and that requires um, training. The lack of PPE uh, makes it difficult to see patients that may be at risk. And, and that made it uh, both challenging for the team as well as patients who felt that they would like to be seen. The advice that we were given was that if patients needed to be seen and we were unable to see them, they should go to hospital. Um, but there are many patients who do not want to go to hospital um, for various reasons. They may have had a very bad experience or they may um, have difficulty with transport or, or other things. They fear that when they go to hospital, the families may not be able to see them or visit them. Um, one, of my, one of my team members was highlighting the issue of, okay, most of the time when we are talking on the phone, um, we are addressing usually physical symptoms. Um, but what if somebody needs to come and see you, um, really for that social contact, that they're, they're, they're isolated at home? Um, what if they say, can I have a hug? Can I shake your hand? And with social distancing, all of this becomes challenging. So we needed to talk about how do you provide, show empathy, show care, 
with social distancing and when you're wearing a mask. Um, and many of these things are not really highlighted in, in, in the guidelines. Um, going out to see people in the community, you are struck by the challenges of how people have to live. Um, and that's where financial issues, um, large number of people, big families living in small crowded conditions, um, it's not easy for social distancing um, to happen. You have got um, um, families that cannot meet as frequently as they normally would. They can't come to see each other with their loved ones. Um, we had one situation where one of our nurses had to wear full PPE going to see a patient that may be at risk. And when she had to don her, her paraphernalia outside the house, that created such um, pandemonium amongst the neighbors and the residents as to what's happening here. Um, so it then, you know, we were then a bit worried about the stigmatization of people in the community when they see someone um, in, in, in a PPE suit. Access to, access to medicine was a problem because with, with a lockdown situation, some patients are, um, may have exhausted their medical, medical their medicines and may not be able to get um, further supplies from their own hospitals. Um, hospital teams are redeployed and, and redesignated, appointments are changed or are delayed. So this certainly affects the, the normal care of, of many of our patients. Um, patients also have difficulty getting extra care when they need caregivers to come and see them. Um, access to food and, and, and um, um, other helpers have been extremely challenging. Um, patients who feel that they needed to be, the families can't care for them, needed to, put, to, to have some respite in care homes, uh, are unable to do that because most care homes at this point will refuse to see any other patient um, and only see the existing um, patient load. And respite care is no longer possible in our hospitals, so it's become quite difficult for, for many of our people in the community. Um, Domestic abuse has been highlighted um, within our society, and I think that's, hap that's happening in many other societies where people have to work in very uh, confined spaces for a, a long time. Um, End-of-life end care has been challenging. Um, last wishes has been in very difficult. A wish to meet with, with members of the family has not been very easy. Um, it's affected funeral preparations. Um, um, with quite sad um, outcomes. People can't say goodbye to each other. Um, culturally, this is a period where there's many celebrations um, and, and it, 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 I don't know, it, it creates discussions as to a conflict between science and religion um, at, this, at this point of time. And, and it's, it, creates a very interesting uh, juxtaposition between the two. And, and between science and religion is the topic of death and dying. Um, and and how, how do we discuss this in the current situation? Is it dealing with the cultural phenomenon and the religious uh, beliefs? Or does science come to the fore? And at the moment, everything is related in, in, within the framework of COVID-19. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know, it's quite sad and challenging uh, when, when traditional cultural rites and gatherings can no longer um, happen. We also started to look at um, the concerns of people working. Um, my team certainly were quite fearful. What if they bring the virus back? What if they get it? Um, the stigmatization, one of my um, nurses, her neighbor does, um, really doesn't like her, tells her to get out because she might be at risk of bringing the virus back to the community. Um, the, their mental health is a concern, how they cope on a daily basis. Um, so what we have done is 
although the idea was that we should work remotely as, as, as much as possible, we decided that no, we are not going to. Um, that as a team, we will still meet every morning. We will do all the screening tests and sanitization, check temperatures, social distancing, but we still meet as a team. And what seems to have happened over the last four weeks of this was a sense of teamwork and camaraderie and support. And for people to see each team member not just discuss the clinical issues, but to share frustrations, humor, encouragement, um, I think has been extremely helpful to, to make them work um, and see some pride in, in their work and their team. We've also doing, we're also doing some journaling, uh, reflective journaling amongst the team members, and that has also been very useful in getting them to reflect back on many, many different topics. And it's, it's, been, it's been quite um, um, enlightening to, to see the depths of, of feeling and reflection that each of the team members bring um, over, over this period. They also are concerned about their jobs as well. Um, what will happen to them? Will they still have a job in, in this situation where the economy is going to plummet significantly for a, a foreseeable amount of time? So these are really some, some of the concerns that we have with, with the workers. Then I will probably say something about the community at large. And I think that we, we all live in a community and society and there is this hunger for information um, and, and, and a fear um, as well. And the risk of disinformation, there's, there's so many things that's been passed around through social media and whatever else. And it's, it's both a source of frustration and laughter as well sometimes. And it's, it's one, of the, one of the important things is to educate the community on, on making sure they have reliable information um, so that they can be more prepared to deal with, um, with the pandemic issues at the, at the moment. So, and then we need to wrap up. Yeah, I'm going to wrap up. I think that in the end, there's, there's a lot that we can offer um, in, in this situation. I think that, that we are geared to dealing with uncertainty. We are geared to working with good communication skills, with good symptom management, um, end of life care, grief and bereavement. I've been talking to some of my colleagues around the region and they are helping with, um, with people in intensive care, uh, assisting with education, uh, debriefing. They are working both at the front line and as well as the community support. Um, I think there's, there's a lot that we can do. Um, the guidelines are, are, are wonderful, but I think I would like to see a little bit more of the, of, of the human element um, to what we have in terms of just dealing with PPE and ventilators um, and, and death rates. Um, I think we need more humanity um, to be shown in, in this pandemic. And I think palliative care is really something that needs to be uh, put in place with all our governments. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edmund. Uh, and I didn't see you're practicing social distancing uh, in your in your I be on, away from us. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, really, very thoughtful. We have. Um, one more presentation and then we'll have uh, a chance to answer some of the questions. We're not gonna be able to answer all the questions, unfortunately. Uh, we also want you to know that um, this um, webinar and um, a copy of the slides from this webinar will be made available after the sessions over um, through uh, our website and um, the COVID-19 um, COVID um, page, as well as the global um, palliatecare.org. So I'd like to turn now uh, to India and to uh, Smriti Rana, who is the Programs Director for Pali in India. Um, Smriti, over to you. I'll start your story when you're ready. Let me know. Um, thank you, Stephen and uh, Liz. Um, just before we uh, start with the slide deck, uh, one of the things that I'd like, to, I mean, I, there was so much that Edmund said that resonated with with me and what we're trying to do here. And we have a lot of similarities, but also India having the kind of diversity that it does. Um, we have a few unique challenges of our own as well. So I'm gonna uh, 
uh, be stating some of those things, those problems that existed before the pandemic, um, how it has, how the pandemic has then affected our existing systems and uh, where we are headed now. Um, one thing though, uh, which I'd like to point out is that like in most low or middle income countries, the need for palliative care is greater in a country like India, simply because disease specific treatment does not reach our patients in time or adequately enough. So while we follow the same definition of palliative care that is outlined in WHO, but in our context, life threatening um, is to be used keeping in mind uh, life in the broader sense in that, in, in that sort of context. Uh, which means that we may include life-limiting um, conditions like paraplegia and you know other things that are not really traditionally in the in the scope of palliative care in the West. Um, so if you could just pull up the slides now, Stephen, that'd be great. Okay, just a second. Um, while while you're pulling that up, also uh, we 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 um, have to adhere to the total pain uh, aspect of palliative care, which is looking at it in all in all domains: physical, financial, social, economic, psychosocial, spiritual. And uh, so, part of this presentation, I'm also going to be talking about. Uh, some of those aspects that have been affected in India that has had that have had an impact on the palliative care uh, delivery that we are doing. Um, well, to start with, uh, may I have the next slide, please, Stephen? Yeah. Uh, this is just a statement of the problem uh, as things existed before the pandemic. Firstly, uh, the the first point is that uh, can we have the first point, please, Stephen? Yeah, that 10 million Indians were already in pain and other serious health-related suffering prior to the pandemic. Uh, there was already poor access to primary care and uh, palliative care teams often found themselves filling in for primary health care teams. For example, you know, management of diabetes and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and in terms of poverty, we have about 30%, approximately 30% of our population already living below the poverty line. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with what that is, it's, about, it's approximately 32 rupees in rural settings and uh, 47 rupees in urban settings, which is less than a dollar. Um, and according to a report that came out uh, in 2017, about 55 million Indians are pushed below the poverty line annually by catastrophic healthcare expenditure. So that's what we were already dealing with. Next slide, please. And uh, this was a pretty uh, staggering statistic that came out to, from the National Crime Bureau report, which said that one in five suicides in India occur due to health-related reasons. Now, this could mean several things. It could mean that there was unmitigated pain, there was distress, uh, poor symptom control, or the fact that healthcare costs uh, drove people to uh, suicide simply because they didn't want to be a burden on their families. Um, coming to the economic part, I mean, more than 90% of our workers are in the informal sector. And uh, as per another study, approximately 139 million internal migrants exist in India. That's inter and intrastate movement. That's a 2011 census. Uh, the reason I'm putting all these numbers out there is to show you how staggering the numbers really are and what we're dealing with. And there is this rhetoric going around uh, that says that, uh, yeah, you can post that. Um, Stephen, that the pandemic is a great leveler. It affects the rich and the poor and everybody, but that's really not true at all because um, the next point, Stephen, is that it disproportionately, I mean, it has a disproportionately large impact on the poor and the vulnerable, and uh, they form a large cohort of who we already deal with. Um, as most of you might know, India has gone into a pretty tight lockdown. And uh, there's absolutely no interstate movement. There's no movement from outside coming in. Um, and uh, essential services are on, but uh, we've recently extended our lockdown by another uh, three weeks. So the lockdown, it's, so th there is the impact of the disease itself, and then there's the impact of the lockdown. And uh, we've seen an un unemployment go up 23% to 23%. That's a loss of livelihood, and that's an impact of the lockdown. Um, next slide, please. We've seen a massive disruption in supply chains. 
for food, for essential commodities, as well as for medicines. Next point, please. Uh, there is a marked decrease in access to essential facilities like healthcare. People are not allowed to move around. So even though healthcare facilities are open, people can't get to them because they don't have transport. We have a huge elderly population. Um, in Kerala alone, we have about a 176,000 elderly people living alone, out of which 140 odd thousand are women living alone, elderly women living alone. So for them to get out and access healthcare becomes even more difficult at a time like this. And uh, again, this has been all over the news, we've seen a huge displacement of the mig migrant worker population. Uh, the lockdown was called in with, with not a lot of time to spare, which didn't give a lot of people um, the opportunity to make their way back home. We, we saw a massive, we're seeing a massive exodus of people within the country. Um, and if you recall the earlier number, 139 million migrant workers within the country, that's a lot of people who are far away from home. And historically, migrant workers don't have great access to healthcare anyway. They're one of the marginalized communities. Um, just, uh, just to show you what it looks like, um, Stephen, if you could just pull up the next slide. Um, this is a picture taken at a bus stop in the capital city of Delhi uh, when people heard about the lockdown. These are migrant worker, workers who wanted to go back home and they appeared there in the thousands. And this is after we, there's a call for social distancing. You can see that some of them are wearing masks. Um, if you could just go back, uh, see it? yeah, and uh, you, can, you can just about imagine what, uh, what layer of tragedy we are adding to the existing one. Um, but this is still an unresolved issue. It's still being, it's still being addressed. Um, and of course, uh, the, tra the travel also happened in extremely unsanitary and uncontrolled conditions. So uh, this is another ticking bomb in a sense. Next slide, please. Um, now, while my colleagues have addressed, um, you know, some of the global issues that are common to all of us, um, I just want to, you know, sort of flag some of the things that we are concerned about that might happen as a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, so much of our attention and energy is now focused on that. Could we be missing uh, some very important, uh, you know, uh, some potential uh, disasters that are simmering under the surface? Um, next slide, please. One of them, of course, uh, and it, this is going to be an inevitable outcome, more, more poverty. And... Um, if you just hit that point, point please, Stephen. Uh, one more. Uh, we've seen an estimated 120 million jobs lost in the first two weeks of the lockdown. And uh, it, some are calling it the largest single stroke job destruction ever recorded. Um, when that happens, obviously health um, gets deprioritized. If, if people don't have jobs, they don't have food to eat, they don't have places to live. Um, healthcare is something that definitely gets impacted very, very adversely. Um, next uh, point, please. And uh, the disruption of the food supply chain um, also has a massive impact on farming communities. And as most of you know, that India has a huge um, uh, agricultural community which is which is suffering considerably. Uh, there's you know there's a there's a ban on import and export. There's increased shortage in perishables. Uh, there's a perception of scarcity, and uh, there are bottlenecks in last mile delivery. So uh, all of this is causing a lot of other issues as well, which is going to have an impact on the population at large and our health uh, in general. Next slide, please. Another, um, another outcome is that manageable conditions will become life-threatening because of unavailability of or lack of access to medicines. Um, some medication is already out of stock. Uh, there are elderly and bedbound patients who cannot access uh, the pharmacy, even if it's across the street. And um, then, of course, we have the fact that there's law enforcement issues. We've already heard stories of people who have um, who have come, I mean, who who've gone across the street to go and buy medicine, but uh, they've been stopped by cops and sent back. And we have. Uh, you know, a problem with getting fresh prescriptions because a lot of these people are, are extremely poor, very underprivileged. They don't have access to a telephone like Edwin was also saying. And to get a fresh prescription from the doctor becomes a problem. Um, next point, please. 
Um, there is all, there's also a problem of tracking uh, people's health because of uh, no laboratory tests and uh, labs are open, but there's no transport. And uh, of course, uh, lack of access to doctors because uh, the doctors are available, but people can't get to them. Next slide, please. Just give me one. Um, Stephen, can I just take a moment, please? Um, I have one a slight technical issue here. Well, well, uh, Smriti is away. I want to make a um, just an announcement that we're going to be over the next six or seven weeks doing webinars uh, like this one um, on a weekly basis at the same time and same date. Uh, and these are webinars uh, will have with them um, briefing notes that we're that we're preparing that will be uh, used to provide some guidance on a series of twenty or more topics. Uh, these uh, briefing notes and webinars are being organized by uh, the four international organizations in, in the beginning of, of this uh, presentation, uh, including the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, uh, the International Children's uh, Palliative Care Network, uh, Palchase uh, Palliative Care and uh, Emergencies, Humanitarian Emergency Situations, and then uh, Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance. So, Mark your calendars. We'll be we'll be sending out registration information for these upcoming webinars, and hope you can um, can join us for those as well. The next one will be uh, the next topic. Actually, will be on human rights, access to medicine, and ethics issues. Thank you, Stephen, for for um, announcing those and just thinking about today and the messages that we have had. Um, I think, Edmund, as you said, there's a flow in this conversation and an understanding that this pandemic um, has not just got such a, a, a burden physically, but a burden emotionally, spiritually, economically, um, and that that's that the the connectivity of those things together are really creating something that um, the world has never seen before. Um, and I think, but with with our technology, we're actually much more aware of this. And I find it so um, uh, powerful that we have been able to hear in detail the um, these illustrations that are from um, you know local communities saying this is this is what is is happening. I see. Yeah. Um, again. I don't know. If we're back on that. Yeah, I think we want to go to questions because we're we're down to uh, just a little under twenty minutes. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, Smriti, we're gonna we're gonna have to go to questions. If you wanna if you wanna make some, um, Smriti, yes, we're gonna I'm have back. To, we're gonna have to go to questions now. Uh, do you want to make any final comments? Yes, on, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Um, I just uh, wanted to mention one last thing, Stephen, if you still have that presentation with you. Go ahead and say whatever, what you need to say. Yeah. Um, the, the, main, um, the main issue that we are quite concerned about is the fact that are we heading for another pain crisis? And uh, already we have reports of people who have had difficulties in renewing their manufacturers, who've had difficulties in renewing their licenses. And the disruption of the uh, supply chain has very, very clearly affected uh, the movement of opioids in our country. So you're very familiar with the, the massive task that we started, I think, I mean, my colleagues across India started 25 years ago now uh, in order to make uh, morphine more accessible. But uh, we're wondering whether we're staring down you know, a disaster where we're going to take a big step back. Uh, we did some random sampling across India and we found that a lot of institutions may have uh, morphine for the next month or so, but they're relying on their distributors to supply them, but the distributors themselves do not have access from the manufacturers because of the lockdown. So while in Kerala, we are okay because we have a state level manufacturer, uh, we see that this might be an impending crisis in the rest of the country. And that is something for all of us to really pay attention to. And uh, we will need to see where the supply chain is broken, advocate for the relevant authorities there, 
and uh, engage stakeholders and you know create some awareness on the state national and international levels because uh, once the covid crisis is resolved whenever that is uh, we will possibly have a massive pain burden crisis on our hands uh, which we need to think about as we speak uh, right now and uh, one last closing statement is that i know there's a lot of good news about kerala um, and about the way kerala is handling the covid crisis but as always kerala may not be representative of the rest of the country um, but one thing that has really uh, worked here is that uh, the community participation which was also the cornerstone of the successful palliative care initiatives in india uh, are today again proving to be the cornerstone of successful uh, covid response and uh, just to give an example in pallium india we you know we have a home care team we see about 1350 patients every month in their homes and we had to scale back but uh, and there was while we still have teams running to make sure that there is procedural and clinical support being given to our patients uh, there are certain non clinical uh, you know uh, ways of supporting families that we haven't been able to do so we put out an advert in the newspaper asking for volunteers and within 24 hours we got 87 responses out of which 50 have now been trained and uh, we've spoken with the local law enforcement they have been recognized as volunteers we have safeguards in place and these people are now helping us reach people who are lonely anxious in need of errands being run and really it's what community participation is uh, is doing for us even now so rather than having to invent the wheel or start from scratch uh, in many ways we're building on our palliative care fundamentals and that's holding us in good stead so um, i'm sorry i had that technical glitch in between but thank you for hearing yeah. that clearly you are you, you're facing some incredible challenges um in, in the time ahead um i'd like before we have our uh, panelists give uh, some closing comments. I'd like to take a few questions, if we could. Kate, are you able to um, help us with that? Thanks, Stephen. Um, we've just been um, collating the questions as they come in, and um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. So um, I'll just start with the ones that um, people have been asking quite a lot and that have broad relevance. Um, the first one was, um, what are the implications of COVID-19 for people with underlying medical conditions or palliative care needs, especially in resource poor settings during lockdown? And then would you like to start on that one, or Alicia? Or Liz? Either. Just, so one piece and and we don't have any published evidence on this yet but you know you have to look for the good news in the face of this calamity and there is some initial evidence um, that while those who are immunosuppressed ill um, are more likely to are, are more susceptible to getting the virus they're also less likely to suffer the most severe consequences of the virus um, the idea behind that is that if you have a suppressed immune system, it can't actually kick in in the same way. So we may be seeing more evidence on that, which would actually be particularly, I think, for our cancer patients, um, some, some calming news in the face of what is, is a calamitous situation. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment on that? Go ahead. Um, then we've got a, a couple of related questions um, from a Kenyan palliative care medical student studying at Makerere in, in Uganda. Um, so with the current lockdown where most patients are not receiving care, um, would the panelists recommend um, a new strategy to ensure access to palliative care and um, continuity of care? And then the second part of that question is how um, best can bereavement support be given to families who are losing loved ones um, in the context of COVID-19 um, and lockdown? Um, Stephen, may I just um, add something? All right. Uh, we've, uh, some of our colleagues have uh, put together, uh, after a lot of very diligent work, an e-book uh, which covers a lot of these uh, topics uh, from, you know, symptom control to uh, care at home, to bereavement, to the myths, uh, pretty much everything pertaining to uh, palliative care guidelines in the COVID crisis. And that is open source. And uh, many of our colleagues from Kerala and also, in fact, Moira Leng has been a part of that. 
So we're happy to share that resource with everybody who's, who's here today. The, the briefing note for this session on, of low and middle income countries also has a uh, link to that uh, document in it as a resource. I want to just acknowledge uh, Dr. Emmanuel uh, Louis Rica, the Executive Director of the African Palliative Care Association, who unfortunately was delayed in joining us. And unfortunately, we don't have the time to go forward with your presentation, but we're certainly glad to see you and have you participate in the Q&A at this point and maybe make some final comments in the last few minutes. Um, Kate, oh, uh, just to mention on, uh, on grief and bereavement, I mean, I think we're facing some very serious uh, consequences of very uh, complicated uh, grief issues, you know, due to the problems with lack of uh, ability to participate in the caregiving process and, and inability to communicate with people near, near the end of life. Uh, and even an ability to attend funerals. So it's it's going to create some very complicated um, grief uh, situations for us. Uh, Kate, you want to give us one or two more questions? Uh, sure. Thank you, Stephen. Um, firstly, um, there's been many requests for documented best practice uh, guidelines and strategies. Um, I think the best way to address this is to um, say that we'll be updating our resources page on the WHPCA website um, following um, these requests um, and if you uh, navigate to our website I'll put the link in the chat um, by next week we'll have um, the resources specifically addressing the questions um, here today. I know IAHPC and ICPCN um, also have um, really uh, thorough resource sections on their website um, so um, the last question um, is one that's, you know, it might be uncomfortable for some people, um, but it's something that really does need discussing. Um, and it's a question that came in from Dr. Carla Centeno, um, and he asked, is humanity the key word to be pronounced by palliative care specialists in this COVID pandemic? Would it be much more, it, it would be much more appropriate even than the word palliative? Um, and he would like to hear the panelists' opinion on this. I think if I heard that right, is, is humanity the core word? Is that right? Is humanity the core word rather than the word palliative? Yeah, and that, I, th I think that's a really uh, important issue and, and an issue that Felicia mentioned around talking about physical distance, but socially, emotionally connected. Um, at the heart of palliative care is compassion. Compassion means with suffering. It means about noticing, noticing suffering, feeling, having empathy, but critically, it means acting to alleviate suffering. And palliative care does that. So perhaps, um, it's, it's really important that the, the, what lies behind palliative care in this pandemic is also understood. It's about um, the care to alleviate suffering of all. And we only can do that by noticing, caring and being with and taking action. So uh, it's not, uh, the, the word is there, but behind it is something that's so much more um, vast and belongs to all of us. Thank you. That's lovely, Liz. And uh, we're also seeing a lot of uh, growth in uh, development of compassionate communities around the world that embody some of those values that uh, Carlos and Liz were talking about. Um, we have maybe time for one quick question, if you have any more burning questions, Kate, and then we'll go to wrap up. Um, sure. There's been a lot of um, talk about using um, smartphones um, and telemedicine in um, you know, filling filling the gap and providing palliative care when um, you can't physically be with your patients. Um, so a question that came in um, was how will COVID-19 impact people with serious illness who do not have access to a smartphone or the technology to access palliative care through telemedicine? Smita, do you want to comment on that? Um, no, that is a challenge. That has been a challenge. Uh, we've well, uh, we set up a helpline uh, initially with 12 of our social workers who reached out to our existing patient base. Um, I mean, in, luckily for us, most people did have access to telephone lines, but the ones that didn't were actually visited at home and assessed. And we did categorize them as very vulnerable or you know, in need of a visit once a week or um, you know, something less frequent than that. 
um, and if people required to be brought in for symptom control or for end of life care, then that was also done. But um, this is an ongoing challenge. I can't claim to have any solutions for people who don't have access to um, you know, telephones and internet, um, except that this engaging the community is really, really important. And here, even self-governance bodies at the local level, at the village level, it becomes very important to partner with them and uh, this is actually an opportunity to activate more, you know, people, I mean, incorporate palliative care practices and principles into a lot of what people are doing. So uh, I would say engaging the community would be very, very important for people who don't have access to technology. Well, I think we definitely one of the things we're learning is that people, um, that we can do a lot more virtually. I mean, we're always, we're high touch, low tech, but I think we're gonna have to be able to do both more effectively in the future and going forward. Um, let's then take uh, some comments from the panelists. And I'd like to start with uh, with uh, um, Professor Nall. Uh, Felicia, if you could make some closing comments on on your on these questions that we've been discussing today, or do you? Of course, thank you, and thank you for the amazing questions. And I'm I'm, I'm I think ideal is to start with the the last question. So. Um, this disease may in fact be a, a great equalizer. Um, the way that it spreads is terribly democratic. Um, and that will make those who are wealthy actually be forced to think about those who aren't. I think that's the, the good news. Um, the not very good news is that we've also and already seen in the United States, for example, how mortality from this disease um, is terribly inequitable. You are going to be able to look, I think, over time by postal code and see who did and did not survive in, in larger ways. And, uh, you know, there's a terribly accurate paper on this that describes what happened with the Titanic um, and how those on the lower decks did not survive and those on the higher decks did. And that is something that we need to, to stand up against, I think, and also be very, very clear that if we're not providing services and supporting those who are in most need. And I think we have to add those without telephone access are among those um, forced migrants, any kind of natural disaster, um, those who are suffering because of differences related to ethnicity. Those are the ones who are at most at risk and their isolation is not by any means absolute in the face of, of coronavirus. I think there's a huge set of equity lessons to be learned um, from what we're seeing, and we are in time to do something about that. And I suggest we make full use of the fear of contagion to do something in support of those who are most in need. And you can start with those who have no access to technology. Um, I just wanted to highlight the incredible importance of introducing, P of introducing palliative care and pain relief directly into universal health coverage. And then again, this calamity um, may make that possible. Um, encourage us not to use the term social distancing. I'm very uncomfortable with that term, even though it's what's being used officially in the literature and uh, in media. And, and talk about physical distancing and, um, and actually uh, distance used for embracing. Um, because there is no reason why we can't embrace each other using technology while practicing physical distancing. I want to also highlight the need to insist on a gender lens when we look at the impact of this disease and how caregiving burden may be forced, continually forced, on women and girls and what that is going to mean, as well as looking at what I think one of the questions mentioned, um, the fear that we have about increased gender-based violence and violence in the home, particularly if women are not complying with all of these needs around, around caregiving. And just finally to highlight that we have a commentary coming out in Lancet uh, next week, and uh, we invite you all to, to keep an eye on that. Thank you all for organizing this and to my panelists. Excellent. Thank you very much, Felicia. Wise words. Liz, Deden, or Smiki, any final comments? Um, so I, okay. um, I think in, in, in Asia, uh, palliative care is seen as a nice specialty. It's um, conflict averse. We don't want to shout about it. We make excuses for what we do. Um, and I think we need to be a little bit more, um, we need to be stronger advocates. Um, we need the development of leaders that are knowledgeable 
persuasive and that can assist in, in really compelling our governments to include palliative care um, a lot more within the healthcare structures. Thank you very much. Anything further? Yeah, um, I, I would say that the majority of doctors and nurses are not aware of palliative care in our country. And while this may not be the time to really sort of educate them on that, um, we find that the bulk of current discussions and planning do turn out to be about how to improve provision to a large number of ventilators and other you know, life support measures. Uh, and not a lot of thought is given to triage and provision for palliative care and appropriate end of life care, not just for COVID patients, uh, even for the ones who've been existing who are vulnerable to begin with. So I think those conversations um, still need to be had and uh, it's, it's going to be a pretty monumental task, but, uh, but it needs to be brought into the conversation. Um, and I think there's a lot of that coming from the West where people have already been in the, you know, in the throes of, of the crisis. Uh, we, we can still learn from them. We still have a little bit of time. And I think the principles of communication that we apply in palliative care are so important right now. Um, in every healthcare setting. Um, so be it you know, telemedicine or even when seeing patients face-to-face uh, -face and their families as well. So that is something that I think um, all, all of healthcare would benefit from at this point. Thank you. Liz, anything for you? Just to say, I, I started um, this whole session talking about that, that, that the resilience of health systems across the globe had been tested by this pandemic and found wanting. But what has been shown is that community resilience is powerful, it's strong, and communities are looking for pathways, and volunteers are looking for pathways to work and to act and to be together. So it's a, a role, a duty, a call of all of us, particularly with faith communities, to engage together and to lay down pathways to go forward. Oh, nice, nice ending note. Well, I want to thank our panelists and all of our attendees and guests who joined us. Uh, on behalf of uh, all four of the international uh, organizations. Um, we hope you can uh, join us again for future webinars and thank you all very much for your kind attention. Stay well, uh, wash your hands and your phones and uh, be safe and take care and have a good weekend. Bye everybody. <laughs>